Welcome to the SPREE seminar. Today we have Dr Nick Engerer here and Nick has a background in meteorology and he did his PhD at ANU on uh, distributed PV forecasting and um, Nick's now a lecturer at the Fenner School at ANU and um, since completing his PhD he's built on that work to put together a large ARENA grant working with uh, distribution network service providers around Australia mm -hmm. and um, he's working with them to uh, put together PV models and forecasts to help them manage the high penetrations of distributed PV that we're now seeing in our networks around Australia and as part of that grant um, he's also founded a startup called Soulcast which he'll be talking about a bit more in his presentation today. So thanks very much, Nick, for joining us. Thank you, Anna. A great introduction. Well, thank you. Thank you. Great applause. Appreciate that. So thank you for the introduction, Anna. Now, my name is Dr. Nick Enger, as she said, and I'm really, really pleased to be here today at UNSW. You know, I was at the Photovoltaic Specialist Conference last year, and that was when it really was hit home for me, just the type of really powerful work in the solar energy space that has come out of this university. And uh, in the solar, in terms of the solar community, really uh, noting that at an international level. So it's really a privilege for me to be here talking to you guys via this uh, spree venue. I'm very, very excited about it, and I've been looking forward to it for quite a while, honestly, and really thinking a lot about what I would come and say um, to a school that has already done so much in solar energy, and uh, and also has some nice overlaps with the work that I'm doing uh, myself and really I see the number one message I want to go with is this idea of teaming up for the solar powered future uh, because we are moving into exciting times for solar energy for energy storage and for renewables overall in Australia and really we have reached a point of I think transformation in our electricity networks here in this country and where they will be going in the very near future is going to be quite exciting so I think that working together to create solutions is exceptionally important and when we do that working together I want us to think big I like big ideas big ideas get me excited I like ideas so big it makes my head hurt and I have to wrap my head around and really think about the details and and wrestle with something and I'd like to do that with you guys today and not only think big but then be bold about those big ideas and go out there and execute and do it and so that takes working together and I want to talk a bit about some of that today. So first thing I want to do is I would love to connect with you. If we can, you know, be connected on Twitter. I'm an active tweeter. I love, love Twitter. It's great. I'm on LinkedIn. That's where I do most of the professional connecting. I would like to be networked with you. So please do take the time to just connect with that and with me. Uh, I wanted to quickly clarify that, you know, Anna mentioned I have this uh, role in this company, Soulcast that I just want to be very clear that I'm representing the Australian National University here today and we'll be talking about our, our research project from the ANU perspective but it is important to draw out that I do have this other role in this company Solcast which is a solar forecasting and modeling company and uh, is really actually an important part of taking this R&D that we're working on at the ANU and getting it out into the real world and I'll elaborate a bit further on that throughout the course of this talk. The other thing that I see is I've got this role as an academic, this role working in a startup, but I also have a role as a human being. And I think that that's one that we don't often appreciate or really come back to. And that's really the spot I think that we can make the best types of connections when we start to think big and go bold. Because we all got that human element of believing we really can move toward this big solar powered future. And I want you to, to draw from that as we uh, discuss ideas today. So for me professionally, I'm really interested in two really big objectives in terms of solar power and that is smoothing the transition of the electricity sector to high penetrations of solar energy technologies we know that that's not a simple transition we're moving to variable or intermittent power generation from solar energy devices and this has long been a discussion about how we would manage that intermittency and the technologies I'm going to discuss, discuss today really focus on doing uh, a simple part of that in terms of removing uncertainty about the intermittency of the solar PV technologies and really ultimately to raise the allowable penetrations of solar electricity uh, generating electricity devices in our energy markets and networks and that's not something I can do all on my own that takes a team of people that takes a body of science 
And while I have it up there as a, as a personal objective, that is a collective objective that I know that we all believe in and I'm happy to be here discussing today. And one of the other things I really like to do is uh, really challenge the university um, in research and education to really be real world oriented. And this aligns really well with the strategic vision that our vice chancellor set out for the, the ANU and also what we see more broadly across our university of sector of engaging with industry. Even our, our metrics and funding arrangements are changing to encourage us to do just that. So I think it's a great time to challenge some of the existing barriers that exist between universities and uh, real world application of the technologies that we come up with. And I have some creative ideas on how I think we can do some of that. And I uh, also have to acknowledge that there's been many instances of both UNSW and the ANU successfully doing this in the past that we can look to. I also see a important level of human objectives, coming back to that human role and being a human being. And really, I love inspiring uh, people. I love feeling inspired. And I find that the human stories are what do that most often. And I love the networking together because that's how we accomplish these big, bold ideas. And I also want to be a part of changing the narrative that we too often hear about our future. And I find that particularly being an atmospheric scientist, that it can be quite uh, doom and gloom when it comes to things like climate change and the pace at which our electricity sector is transitioning away from fossil fuels and the implication that that seems to have on our future climate system. But I also would like us to remember the abundance in which we live and that really that the future and the technologies that are created are all of our own human volition and creation and that we can actually be collectively a part of creating a better, more beautiful future if we decide that that's what we want. And so I'm not saying we can't avoid climate change, but I am saying there are many different ways that we can compensate for that and we can accelerate the deployment of renewables and that will be greatly assisted by each of us having a more positive narrative and uh, working on doing that together. So that's one of the things I'm really here to talk about today. And so I love this quote from, from Larry Page, CEO of Alphabet, formerly Google. Um, if some of you aren't aware, it is now Alphabet, an overarching parent company. But I like this quote. He says, I have a very simple metric I use. Are you working on something that can change the world? Yes or no? The answer for 99.99999% of people is no. I think we need to be training people on how to change the world. And for me, I'm a bit of a big picture thinker, a bit of an idealist. I'll fully admit it. All right, and, but I love that idea of changing the world and that's probably why I've decided to have his role in an entrepreneurial startup company route because that's where startup companies are allowed to have their energy come from. But I think that universities can be a big part of the changing the world as well and that they already have been if you look at several of the different uh, things that, that universities have done with different technologies in the past. And I think that with renewable transformation we're undergoing here in Australia, we have that chance again. And so I want to do big, bold things with you guys. And I want to weave my own narrative into that to talk a little bit about my own work and how I'm trying to manifest this kind of courage that's needed to go out there and try things that are new and maybe b so big that they're a little bit scary. So for myself, I really like this idea of getting science off the shelf um, from you know, a, fa a fairly young age for a research academic. And in my work, on my master's degree back in the University of Oklahoma, there was a joke amongst uh, the rest of the graduate students where they commented on how they were going to put a $20 bill in their master's thesis or their PhD dissertation and put it on the shelf in the library and see if it was still there 20 years later. Because <laughs> nobody would read it. Nobody would pick that science up and look at it. And I wanted to get something off the shelf. And so that's what I did with my master's degree. I did some work in the solar space. I actually made a big transition out of doing severe thunderstorm research and because and, I saw this opportunity that was out there in solar. And, and that is really something that I began with on the front foot for my PhD is that I wanted to create some technology that could be applied and have real usefulness. And so when I embarked on this adventure of doing my PhD, uh, I of course didn't know what I was getting myself into and the number of hours I would slave away in front of a computer and, and you know totally want to rip my own hair out at moments of my code not working after hours of running. But it is a really transformative process when you get to go through your PhD. So I know some of you here have just submitted your PhDs, some of you have just started. Uh, it's a journey that will change you and bring you uh, to a future where you've gone through a process of really thinking hard about something 
you can't skirt away from it doing a PhD. And for me, thinking hard was about solar radiation modeling. <laughs> it's more exciting than it sounds, I promise, at least from my perspective, being a cloud lover, and also solar, solar PV technologies. And so the work that, that I did was actually working with solar PV system power output data. How can we use that data in a useful way? And one of the techniques that I came up with was this um, little algorithm or coefficient or whatever you want to call it, KPV, uh, which was really a tool for PV power upscaling. So how can you use PV system power output in a way that where you monitor a certain number of PV systems, you can then estimate the total power output from surrounding PV systems. And that's published in Solar Energy Journal, and you can dig into that a bit more if you would like. Um, but from there, I saw that there was potential to use PV systems effectively as solar radiation sensors, as useful pieces of information for solar radiation and solar PV system power modeling. And so I spent a bit more time working on doing some uh, radiation model validation, building a diffuse fraction or separation modeling tool uh, called the Enger 2 model that was well received and did really well in terms of validations against other models. Did some work on quality control of PV data power output. But really what all that was building toward was this idea, this picture I had in my head of this, uh, the ability to see what solar PV systems in space, out there deployed, what their power output really was, and begin to inform back to the energy networks and the distribution network service providers who had to manage the variability of this solar in their network and to give them a picture of what was actually happening with the solar. And so I built this prototype modeling system, the regional PV simulation system. And the way that it worked was that we monitored around 100 live PV systems. And I say live data is, you know, 10, 15 minutes old, coming from a web page called pvoutput.org. And then partnered that up with some distribution network level metadata about where the PV systems were installed in act 2 agls network and the characteristics of those PV systems. Now using that KPV methodology, we can use each of those PV systems, their monitored power output, to then estimate the power output from the neighboring PV systems nearby. And again, there's some details there that I'm not covering, but that's generally how the model works. So use modeling to use the subset of PV systems to estimate the total fleet power output. And that was the regional PV simulation system version one. In version two, which I after my PhD, then advanced this technology just a bit further, I started to group the power output of the PV systems by the distribution network assets. So I got Act2AGL to provide me with the distribution transformers that each of these PV systems were connected to so that I could start to model what was actually happening on the distribution network itself. And so in this little graphic here, I have a PV, uh, PV ramp event which is another thing that I looked at in detail during my PhD, was what are the weather events that cause large-scale collective PV systems, or networks of PV systems, to suddenly change their power output? Because when you have one PV system, one cloud can change your power output instantly. But when you have a network of PV systems distributed spatially, we get what's called geographic smoothing, and of course you end up having a less of response to individual clouds. But sometimes there's still weather events that drive large-scale collective power output um, across entire networks of PV systems, even across something as large as Canberra. And what you see here, and I should have described this a bit earlier, uh, in these polygons is actually each of the individual suburbs of Canberra is one of these polygons. And in this graphic, each of these dots is an individual PV system, as reported by Act2AGL. And from time one to time two here, over a course of 15 minutes in this graphic, we see a change from high power output values to relatively low power output values across nearly the entire network. And in this graphic, red is low power output and blue-green is high power output. And I'll show you an animation from a day where there was convective style cloud cover that was moving quite quickly. Again, using these distribution network transformers down in the bottom right of the image. And so we can see differential cloud motion from the northern end of uh, Canberra to the southern end of Canberra, cleared conditions, a sudden down ramp power output across uh, the entire region, and then a sudden clearing. And this is actually caused by relatively quick moving convective cloud cover, so the types of clouds that end up producing precipitation often can turn into thunderstorms. 
And with this power output uh, fluctuation, we see that across the entire network, we ramp down from around 25 megawatts of power generation uh, to around 5 megawatts in under an hour. Uh, actually, about 30 minutes is about the fastest ramp rate we record. But if you look at individual transformers in this simulation, you actually start to see that these uh, power output changes are much more instantaneous. They have much stronger ramp rates. And what this highlights is really the need to start looking down into this level of detail. There's only, this level of detail might be important to inform power output fluctuations at connection points for the energy market operator or a transmission company. But when it comes down to solar energy integration issues and penetration challenges, we're really needing to look into the distribution network assets themselves. And this was really um, kind of a proof of concept for me in order to get this larger arena project that I'm going to tell you about up off the ground. One of the things that happened for me that I thought was really, really important to share is that at my PhD uh, exit seminar, when I presented on all this work I'd done, I wasn't quite sure where I was going to go next. And I had some input from some mentors. One, Steve Bloom, president of the Australian Solar Council, and the other, Professor Andrew Blakers, uh, who was actually a member of my supervisory panel. And they both gave me that encouragement to say, you know what, Nick, go for it. You're doing some cool work. You've got a good tool here. You've uh, got some unique vision and done some great work with your, with your science. And it's now or never, go for it. You know, go, go take this tool and apply to this arena industry research uh, and development round that's coming up that requires university and industry researchers uh, to partner together. And for me, that was a bit intimidating. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. Uh, to look at a large research grant and to know how to apply for that and to know the processes you have to go through to apply for that, excuse me, is not a very simple and straightforward thing. And so for me, I started off thinking comfortably. Maybe I'll just get one industry partner, do a small project, ask for just a little bit of, of cash from the, from the Australian Renewable Energy Agency, and maybe get an annual professor to be the CI, chief investigator, so that it looks better on paper and I can be a bit more conservative with this. But I've had an interesting experience in my life um, that told me and very, very clearly that life can be quite short. And it's actually... You know, a number of years ago, back in 2013, my wife was actually diagnosed with a rare cancer. Now, I'll just say up front, she's okay now, so don't be too worried. It's not too big of a, of a, a sad story, but it was a tough time for me. And, but what it taught me is that even at a young age, you have no guarantees. And that really gave me that kind of energy to be a big thinker and to go for things and be bold. Because what really did I have to fear besides not getting some money, maybe face, facing some rejection? My life's experience told me to go for it, to think bigger. And that's something that I want to carry out there as a message for each one of us. Whenever we start to think of a big idea, the first thing that starts to happen when we talk about that big idea, maybe we even do it to ourselves, is we start to uh, poke holes in it or try to figure out why it won't work or even make excuses about maybe why we won't pursue that. But I think that this big thinking, this bold thinking, is an important lesson that each of us um, can learn in our own life that the more you show up with that courage, the more life responds to that courage and creates opportunity for you. But that doesn't take away the fact that big ideas are quite challenging. And these challenges come from all different angles. Working with industry is very, very challenging as an academic. Because you're coming in to work with industry, you're trying to engage with industry, and you're facing a complete disconnect in cultures and timescales. So you might have one time frame in mind for your research project. It's going to go for a nice three years. You'll hire your postdocs and your researchers about six to 12 months into the research project. You'll get reports to come out six months after it. You talk to industry, they want the solution now. They want to move quickly. They want to have much more aggressive deadlines. And those tend to be a complete disconnect. The other thing you find with industry that's very challenging is that even if you've got a really good industry applied idea, that there's a lot of misconceptions about what universities can do. And I would like to challenge those. And like I said at the beginning, I see that as kind of one of my roles. And I know many of you who are working with industry might have also encountered this, is that there's an assumption about what universities can or can't do. And that tends to be a fairly conservative one that as we try to move into a uh, more progressive university mindset of engaging with industry, we're all going to confront. So be ready for that. And of course, there's rejection. And for me, that rejection came in different forms. It came from uh, distribution networks that I applied to try to get on board. It came from 
uh, 1-300 numbers that I called because I had no other contact and I was just trying to figure out who to talk to at a given distribution company. And it even came from some big partners that I tried to get on board in the earlier days, like the energy market operator. But rejection's okay. What you realize is it comes in, it makes you feel a bit sad, but you get yourself back up and you go for it again. And rejection really doesn't hurt that bad. So if rejection is what we're afraid of, we need to learn to just take it and deal with it. It's not that big of a deal. We need to be brave. With our own universities, this is another very interesting challenge. As a young person trying to get up a research project within my own institution all by myself, I found it very difficult to even get inserted into some of the narrative that the university was putting out there in terms of recruiting people to work with them just because I didn't really have an established person at the university who uh, knew how all the university processes worked, that knew when to get me into different pitch events or even knew about the project that I was trying to, to get going. So as a young person, it's really important to get that mentor and to really begin to understand how the university processes work. And, and for me, the, uh, that was Professor Blakers, who's exceptionally helpful throughout this entire process in guiding me through. But another really difficult thing that I came to find that was surprising for me was just even coming to understand the own internal processes and delegations within a, a given university. And to any young people who are thinking about doing any research projects, I suggest you make sure you understand that very, very well before you embark on that journey, because that was quite difficult for me at times. A lot of last minute, last minute changes and rushing. And also, as a big thinker, as somebody who really wants to collaborate, I found that there are significant barriers to collaborations across universities, particularly in areas where there might be industry IP that comes out on the other end. And I think that with the transition from, of universities toward more industry applied R&D, there's going to be a tendency for us to create even further barriers between our institutions in the industry research space to say, no, we can't sort this out. There's too much conflicting IP. Universities shouldn't work together on applied research. Because I even came and visited this university to try to figure out if we could collaborate on this research project. But as I began to look into the details of that collaboration, sharing funding, IP, working together across different time scales, trying to negotiate in time to apply for the arena funding, it all became quite messy and difficult. So if we are going to collaborate across universities, we need to have strong collaborative relationships in place before we go for the next funding round and clear objectives on how we're going to handle things like intellectual property and whether or not there's conflicts. So these big ideas come with challenges. And this is only talking about getting the proposal done. I'm not actually even addressing the issues that come up when you start to execute a big project with lots of industry partners as a university academic. And these are things that I'd like to address in the, fu in the future because I think they highlight important points about the type of research we'd like to do and what we're set up to do. I think that would be an important thing to address in the future. But the coolest thing of all is I was actually able to pull this thing off. And I'll tell you what, the reason that I was able to do it was because I did not think comfortably and I did not go conservative on this. I thought big and I was bold and I called lots of distribution networks and I worked my butt off to make sure that I could submit the best possible proposal that I could pull together out of my own capability. And that type of uh, energy and dedication is what it takes to create uh, a new opportunity in a space where there's so much competition. And so what I was able to do is get a three-year project led by the ANU, recipient of Australian Renewable Energy Agency funding on the order of $1 million for a project called Real-Time Operational PV Simulations for Distribution Network Service Providers. And I can say that in my sleep, and I probably do. We could ask my wife because I've said it so many times. <laughs> This project, at the time of submission, had six distribution networks on board. And what I did with those distribution networks is I went to each of them and said, look, I don't want any of your cash. I just want your data. And this is a, a difficult thing for a lot of researchers to access. But it's very, very useful in terms of creating applied technologies. And that data that I was looking for was, where is the small scale solar installed? What are its characteristics and how does it map back to your distribution network? If we can know that information, now we can start to quantify the solar PV variability in your network for you. And this got some traction. There was some uptake of this and uh, got six of these partners on board for the final uh, submission for this project. In collaboration with us, we also had two inverter companies, SMA and Fronius, who are going to be giving 
real-time uh, feedback from solar PV systems to the project and numerous other partners who were supporting the project through other various means including the Australian PV Institute. What we said that we would do is we would create distributed PV modeling and forecasting tools for these distribution networks and deliver it back to them in real time. That's a really important part of accommodating higher penetrations of solar energy technologies and some of you may already know this but it, because these behind the meter solar PV systems do not actively report power output feedback in the vast majority of cases to the network service providers, which means they have no visibility on the solar PV uh, performance from moment to moment or even historically or into the future. This is not an enabling thing. This is, creates uncertainty and it creates responsive rather than proactive network management. So this project to address that uncertainty head on is tasked with having two key outcomes deployment of distributed PV forecasting for distri distribution network service providers and commercialization of the technology and what we're doing with this technology and this is uh, not yet finalized but nearing the end finalization is we're actually licensing this the outcomes from this research project into this startup entity Soulcast. So the reason that I have structured it in this fashion is that in such a fast moving space over the course of three years if we were to build up this technology and keep it in the university and try to get it out there at the end of the project that's an exceptionally challenging thing to do. It keeps the IP tied up until the end of the research project into 2019 we would have missed out on lots of integration and opportunity to work with the distribution networks in an operational sense and with Soulcast we're able to be much more nimble in terms of responding to exactly what the technology's usefulness is. So if we take that IP and we commercialize it into this company throughout stages in the research project, we're actually getting that IP out of the university each year. It's getting a bit better. It's getting out there. It's working with the industry directly. And that's a really kind of progressive, interesting model. The other thing that it allows us uh, to do is that you now have this company that can build expertise and resources on its own through company mechanisms. That company might get customers that are not related at all to this project. We keep those clearly separated. We're not dealing with the DNSPs. That's the ANU's position. But there are other opportunities for that startup. So you can imagine if that company gets going and starts to build some additional resources, that just means that the outcomes of this research project naturally continue to grow and snowball, and that's the goal. So I think this creates a very interesting model and starts a cool discussion about what we can do with university intellectual property in terms of getting it out there, doing work between universities and industry. And so for this project, one of the key outpu outputs that we want is a distributed PV forecasting system. And the way that we're building that is we're working with the Himawari 8 satellite. I'll show you some examples from this satellite uh, and a few slides coming up. But this satellite is incredible. It's the first of an entire fleet of next generation satellites that are being slated for scheduled launch around the globe over the next several years that can sample uh, the entire hemisphere of the globe at approximately one kilometer resolution update every 10 minutes. This enables a very high level of radiation modeling than has ever been available from a satellite before, which is very, very exciting. And then the other thing we're doing, as I discussed before, is grouping distributed PV forecast by distribution network assets. So it's no longer a simple PV forecast. It actually becomes a network mapping tool. We can actually look and say, this is the expected PV generation at a given distribution transformer. This is what's happening on a given feeder line. And that means we can start to pair it with solutions for dealing with PV intermittency. And again, that objective is to demonstrably raise the allowable penetration levels of distributed solar in these participating networks. That's a high goal. That's a big thing to go for. And one of the things I want to team up with, uh, with UNSW is making sure that we accomplish that. So teaming up comes to my core message for today. And there's a quote here from Robert Green uh, from a book called Mastery. And he says, our evolution as a species has depended on the creation of a tremendous diversity of skills and ways of thinking. We thrive by the collective activity of people supplying their individual talents. Without such diversity, a culture dies. And our diversity and our culture, I'd like to consider as all the skills that our respective universities bring together in terms of this solar powered future and how we will realize it. And so I'm looking forward to figuring out how we can collaborate to make big ideas happen. And I had a real interesting moment 
when I was in Perth accepting this award in April 2016. Because I stood amidst this group of nine projects and $17 million of total funding where universities and industry had partnered together to create technologies, applied solutions that all had commercialization potential. That's incredible. And you know, this is really a great example of some of that ideas boom that our government's been talking about over the 2016 year, and it's happening in renewables. And I would ex argue that it's happening all across the sector within renewables, these ideas booms and this real innovation drive. And when I looked around me, I was incredibly proud of all these different projects because they had all engaged in that same hard, difficult work that I did, figuring out how to make this work. How do we get university and industry to work together, create clear commercialization pathways, and still have lots of opportunity for interesting applied science that we can share the outcomes on. And so this was really a high moment for my career. I was very incredibly proud to be counted amongst these other projects. And I felt really good about the future of renewables. But later that evening, as I was walking around, I actually went and visited uh, Elizabeth Key, which is a new built area of Perth that's being built up. It's quite, quite gorgeous. And I was wandering around, enjoying the sights, and was walking back into, towards the CBD of, of Perth and actually walked through the LNG 18 conference, was, uh, which is the 18th annual conference for an exhibition for the export of liquefied natural gas. And all around me, I was, saw this really big, big, big crowds of people coming in off the boats, getting off on their buses. And um, I realized that Malcolm Turnbull had actually opened the conference and it was big to do. And walking through them, I then cast my glance up toward the Perth skyline and saw these big, tall buildings. But what is on these big, tall buildings? What, what companies? BHB Billiton, Rio Tinto, um, South 32, these large companies that are, you know, have, let's see, I wrote down some statistics on this because I think this is really useful. You know, 65,000 companies for, uh, for uh, 65,000 employees for BHB Billiton, 15,000 for South 32. Rio Tinto has 55,000 employees. Um, these are really, really big companies and they uh, have large amounts of influence and drive in our economy and therefore they often set the agenda for how things work and they, and they are what our politicians and our governments look to in terms of deciding what is best for this country because they really actually produce a large number of jobs, a large amount of opportunity. There's no denying that. But if we look at some of the more successful companies in the renewable space, we could look to well, local favorite solar analytics. Just came and visited um, in Canberra last week, told us they had 30 employees, which is incredible. It's awesome growth for them signing up a thousand people a month. It's incredible success. 30 employees. Infigen, which is trading on the ASX, big renewable company, right? Around 50 to 100 employees according to LinkedIn. So if you start to look at the nature of the companies that are experiencing success in renewables, it's really a fraction of what some of these older traditional companies um, that are, have been more long, longer established, uh, what, what they boast in terms of their influence and their number of employees and the number of jobs they create. And so what I think in terms of a realization that I had is that what we're seeing is a large number of smaller companies, distributed energy companies and resources that are showing up. We have Redback Technologies, Reposit Powers. We have uh, our universities creating small companies and, creating, and partnering with startup labs nearby, maybe in the energy space. I heard there's an energy lab nearby here now in Sydney doing energy company acceleration. We have this really cool transition happening with this innovation and ideas. But just as the distributed energy resources of the future are going to be spread out across the spectrum from batteries in homes, solar on people's rooftops, maybe wind farms in, in, on a farm nearby, that this also establishes the distri distributed network of renewable energy companies and ideas and efforts and people. And I think really that it's probably going to stay this way. And so when I think about what we would need to do in order to have a renewably powered, a solar powered future, seeing a new future that's driven by big ideas and renewables, our electricity sector uh, thriving off them, that we can't do this alone. We can't do this separated. We need to figure out how we can be collaborative in a meaningful way. We have to become those big, tall buildings together. There simply isn't going to be these 
old ways of companies gathering large numbers of people into their ranks because you can't do that with distributed energy resources. You can't gather all the sun into one place. You can't gather all the wind into one place. It's the nature of the beast. And it's a really cool opportunity because it means that we can thrive off of a whole diverse range of ideas. But in order for us to become successful, in order for us to drive a new economy, um, to drive a new direction for this country and more, more uh, bigger picture globally, we need to think big together. And that's what I'm here to talk about today. And so we need to start thinking about what are those barriers to that big thinking and that bold new direction for this renewable powered future. So I would argue that we're already bound together by our values and our vision. I know that the people I'm speaking to in this room today value the integration of solar PV and more renewable energy technologies into our electricity grid. We've got a great point for starting off. I don't have to convince you that that's a great idea. And then we all have a similar vision in terms of where we would like to go. But I think that one of the things that too often can separate us is a lack of understanding of one another's direction, a lack of communication and prioritizing, and maybe even some fear of what other people might be doing to compete with your own idea. And I know that myself, I see those elements in my own research. It's easy for me to look at the work um, that is being done here with distributed solar technology integration and forecasting and think, oh, I have competitors. Oh, I should be afraid of them. I shouldn't go talk to them. I shouldn't go tell them what I'm doing or share my data with them because this is my idea. This is my research space. You know, I've, I'll admit I've felt that tendency, but I also see the need to reject that because that's based on fear. That's based on trying to control. We can't have that. There will not be any centralized control of distributed energy resources, distributed energy companies. We will have this big dispersed group. And the only thing that brings us together is the values and the vision. And the thing that keeps us apart is the lack of communication and a groups of misunderstanding and fear. And so while we all have the same objective, we really think this solar powered future is a really good idea, we need some things that we can do. What do we do about that? And again, because this is a distributed thing, it actually comes back to each of us individually. And I'm just going to share some things that I've learned for myself that I think are really helpful for, for communicating back to this crowd today. And I think it all must start with a belief in abundance. I think that too often we are sold a negative narrative, as I talked about in the beginning. And I think with the future of renewable energy technologies, the future is incredibly bright, to use a nice solar pun, right? I think that we have an incredible future ahead. And when you look around at other technologies that are being developed in this world today, whether that be the ability to send rockets into space and bring them back, if it be the abundance of food that arrives into our grocery stores, if it's the technology and the accessibility information that we hold in our, pot our pockets or the robotics that are building cars in our factories, there is abundance in technology all around us. And the same thing is happening with distributed energy resources. But the other part of abundance, the flip side of that, is looking back on ourselves and thinking, is there more opportunity than there are resources? And the answer to that is yes. So if we want to take advantage of that opportunity, we need to pool our resources and work together. And that takes a removal and a letting go of the fear of competition, the worry of what another group or another small renewables company might be doing, and getting back to that big picture, zooming back out and seeing, you know what? There's this big, beautiful, renewably-powered future ahead, and I'm a part of it. How can I contribute? How can I be excited about that? How can I go to whom I think is my competitor and think about ways that we can collaborate and really focus on this stuff together? And so that's a big process of learning to recognize ourselves and one another. Being able to see that we are bound together by our values and vision, and we're only separated by institution and possibly by misunderstanding. And that even though we might be competing universities, the ANU and UNSW, we still have this amazing potential to contribute toward the same interesting, abundant future. And so I suggest that we adopt a philosophy of enablement. That in our own skills and effort, in our own research groups, we think about how could I look at what another research group is doing, partner with them in a way that allows me to supply and share data, to shape ideas, to form deep collaboration, and work toward a future where we can be clearly on the same team and working toward the same objectives. Can we build things collectively? And this philosophy of enablement is something that I'm applying in my own research group today and one of the things I wanted to visit to talk to you about. Because I think that if we try to keep things for ourselves, 
it's not going to work out. And there's a great quote from a very wise man you might recognize. I found if I kept anything as my own, I had to defend it against the world. We can't keep the renewable revolution, the renewable transformation for ourselves. And the more we do that, the more we fight it. So we have to remember it's distributed. That the energy is distributed, but the ideas can be collective. So one of the things that I'm doing with this research project is really focusing on enabling these distribution networks. I'm trying to work with as many of them as I possibly can. And you'll note from the beginning graphic this, that the number of them participating has grown. Because what we're focusing on is removing this uncertainty in solar generation. And we're focusing on doing that in a way that's easy for distribution networks to join and is directly solving the problems that they're facing, which is this lack of information. And so the way that we're going to do this, when I get down to some specifics, backing off of the really big ideas here, is that we're getting this installed PV generator information. We're grouping it by the distribution network, network assets. We're generating the solar power forecast, and we're giving them access to an API. Now, an API is an application programming interface, for those of you who may not be aware. And it's becoming the standard for how information is shared from cloud-based platforms, cloud-based software. The way that we're organizing this is actually quite interesting, I think, if you look at, look at the structure. We've got this startup company, Solcast, that has built this solar forecasting engine. It blends Himawari 8-based solar forecasts from around four to six hours out into a background of seven, uh, out to seven days using numerical weather models, producing probabilistic power output. This is then interfaced with a API that allows anybody to grab solar radiation forecasts anywhere in the world. And you can also do PV power generation estimates anywhere in the world. And in Australia, because of the Himawari 8 satellite, it's super high resolution. It's that one kilometer, 10 minute update type detail. Now what we're doing with the Australian National University is we come in with that DNSP PV data and that network data. And we use it, we use that solar forecasting system as an input to those PV simulations. And then take that output from this, the forecasting engine and give it back to the distribution networks so that they can start using it to understand what's happening with their, solar, with their solar generators on their network, both in the future and in the recent past. And the reason that we're going with this, uh, look, there we go. The reason that we're going with this API framework is it's incredibly flexible. It allows them to use that uh, system in whatever way they'd like, integrate it with whatever system they might like, including GIS software, operational software, or to even just grab data from a web, a web page. This is an example of what that starts to look like. If you take the Himawari 8 radiation data and you map it into PV systems based on their installed capacity and location, you can actually produce a simulation much like the one you saw earlier. This one I've changed the color graphic around on you where we have blue power output being low and red orange power output um, values being high. Sorry about that. Got some feedback that a heat map would make more sense to people's brains. So what we're doing here is we're getting that same collective power output simulation in the top right, but we can also start to do some cool stuff with PV systems. So what we actually see here and the filled in color as these dots here are actually individual PV systems. Just demoing what we can do if we use just the satellite to simulate their power output in the gray down here in the bottom right, and then we compare that to the actual observed power output in red. And this is just the mean across these six systems. And what's really remarkable about this next generation satellite and using some of those high resolution radiation models that I built in my PhD is that we can actually do a really good job at this. We can get very small mean errors in terms of the PV simulation. And that hasn't always been the case with older generation satellites. Bias has always been a very big problem. Sampling interval has always been a very uh, significant uh, element of holding back what you can do for PV power simulations, but not with this next generation of satellites. Because of the spatial sampling, it, you can do some very incredible stuff. And so this is what we'll be deploying across uh, all these different distribution networks, because we'll know where each of these PV systems are. We'll know how it maps back to the network. Now, how does that come back? Oh, well, I put some validation things in here, and I'll, I'll come back to that, actually, because I want to actually talk about this inverter data. I should have put that slide before. I must have made a mistake. If we want to know how well the satellite system is doing, we can actually look at the PV system power output as a way of cross-validating that. We can see if we use the satellite data, we put it into a PV model, and we try to estimate the actual PV system power output, and we can compare it to an actual as observed from the in solar inverter, we can understand whether or not we think clouds 
are thicker than they should be or thinner than they should be or arriving too early or arriving too late. It's a bit difficult to nail the accuracy because there's so many PV system uh, level considerations to take into play, but you can do some informing back to the satellite-based system. So I think this will invite a new, area of, a new era of technologies that will give us exceptionally high solar radiation modeling capability that will enable a new generation of technologies for coordinating storage, and storage charging and dispatch as well as demand side management. Now one of the questions that scientists will always like to know is how good is it? How well can the system perform? And I am working on publishing some of this data so that people can see how the system works and how well it does. But where you start with in this type of modeling is you need to make sure you have a good clear sky model because that's where your radiation background estimate starts from. And I'm just letting you see that we can do a pretty good job with clear skies in terms of looking at the satellite estimate versus the pyranometer uh, based estimate from some Bureau of Meteorology sites. And you can see some time series data examples here. Again, there might be some bias at different times in the black line, which is the estimate from that API, versus the blue Bureau of Meteorology pyranometer estimates. When you start to look into periods of time where there's not clear sky, you get some more spread in the data. And this really comes back to thinking clouds are uh, thinner than they actually are or thicker. And really, it term comes down to determination of that cloud opacity. But presence of cloud, we can do a very good job of determining at least if there's a cloud in place or not. And we can see that from some of this example time series data on the left. When you look at the accuracy over here, you end up with a mean bias error of around 2% and an RMSE of around 11% for a two-month validation period using eight Bureau of Meteorology solar radiation sites. So that's pretty good. When you look at the capability of this um, forecasting system from that startup company uh, aspect that we're using in this system. It's important to validate this for the, for the university research side of the project, which is the reason that I show this graphic. You can actually see that in terms of skill scores, what happens across uh, the different technologies that are available, this is from a paper published in 2016 reviewing solar forecasting methods, that we can do quite well. In fact, we can do better than most of the other technologies that are available. And really, that comes down to the capability of this new fleet of satellites. And so the bigger picture, zooming out, we're going to start to see that this next generation of high resolution satellites, again, is going to enable a large amount of coordination of battery charging and dispatching, demand side management, and all that will be enabled um, and coordinated through solar forecasting, in my opinion. So one of the things that I think is really important is taking these data, these data points and the simulation uh, output from this forecasting system and sharing it openly and freely through this arena project. And that's exactly what we're going to do. So we are building these API across these different distribution network service provider partners, but we also want to expose that API to researchers. Can we then, with this type of information, look at historical analyses of PV variability and intermittency by distribution network asset and create new solutions, new research outcomes? I'm very confident that we can. And so with this, we'll be able to provide zero to seven day radiation and PV output forecasts anywhere in Australia. You can get the different variables of solar radiation are available. And we can also do um, high resolution data sets for any point in Australia historically. We don't have that exposed in the API yet, but I'm really trying to scope the need across the research community of what we can make available through this project through our knowledge sharing outcomes. One thing that I can guarantee we will definitely do is the delivery of PV monitoring data sets and solar radiation time series data sets via the APVI and Australian Renewable Energy Mapping Infrastructure, ARIMI, platforms. Really looking forward to that. And if you have some feedback on what type of data would enable your research, I really want to know. And I will use my resources and my team uh, to work with you on that. So really summarizing this message, I'm here today because I'm very interested in figuring out how we can work together. Um, that's not a message dedicated to any one university from my role. It's a wide open call. Um, I would be very interested to know how this technology can enable people, anybody who's interested in this type of data. And I'm really moving from the place that we're on the same team. And I really want to know what you want to know, what type of data you would like to have so that we can think big and build some meaningful collaboration. So let's work on creating that abundant future together. I think it's an exciting time ahead. I'm very excited to see where it goes. And in terms of what we must do to make sure it's a smashing success is really 
learn how to do that work together so we can act like one of those big, tall buildings and big, strong companies um, as a collective entity. I think I have some specifics on how we can work with UNSW. We had some conversations at lunchtime. I'll leave that slide there for now and really hope that you'll connect with me and ask me some good questions here because I'd love to field them. Thanks very much for your attention. I really appreciate it. Jose, yes. Thanks for the presentation. It was great. Um, very inspiring, too. Um, in your model, how do you deal with PV systems that might be underperforming? Like there might be a problem or more shading or a string is broken or whatever. Yeah, that, that's a really good question, Jose. So the question, in case people um, back home couldn't hear that, is uh, how do we deal with PV system level issues like shading, soiling, inverter failure, strings being out, et cetera? And so the way that we are planning to approach that, and this is a work in progress, one of the places I think we could deeply collaborate, is using the PV monitoring data from SMA and Fronius uh, to inform those things statistically. So can we build statistical representations of loss factors? Can we detect shading? Can we learn how frequent the, uh, frequently these things occur, and then can we statistically model them? So everything that comes out of any of this type of modeling will end up having to come uh, with probability and uncertainty bounds on it. There will always be a level of uncertainty included, and we need to really work toward modeling that uncertainty, um, I think, in the first instance, uh, as informed by statistical models based on the monitoring data. Does that satisfy you? It's a difficult question. It's not straightforward. So can you get more data from the inverter? Like, can, could the inverter tell you I'm, I'm not working or, or I'm having a problem? Yeah, so for example, um, I know that uh, Fronius, as a, as a project partner, does have inverter fault detection capability and uh, uh, many other variable fields and levels of resolution of the data that they can share. And really, that ends up becoming a question of what we find to be necessary, and we could try to request that. So if there's research interest in that, we can certainly go have a chat with Fronius. Last question for me. Um, how much uncertainty is too much uncertainty? Mm. Like, what level? at what level is your model good enough for the NSP or the, the network? You have, so the question is, uh, how much uncertainty is workable, effectively, is a way to summarize that. Where, where have we achieved enough accuracy in the simulations and forecasts? And at the distribution network level for solar forecasting, nobody knows the answer to that. So we actually will be sharing as a project outcome our findings on that exact question. Well, how good is good enough? What level of spatial resolution and temporal resolution is good enough? And what solutions are employed? So stay tuned on that one. We'll be sure to share. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, you, you mentioned that um, one of the biggest uncertainties is to do with the thickness of the clouds. Yes. How is that currently measured? Right, so you have to derive an estimate of the thickness of the cloud and then effectively reduce the clear sky model according to that thickness. So how, yeah, and then so how do we do that from there? Um, we actually do 3D composition of the clouds. So you look at where the clouds end up in terms of um, their cloud top temperatures. So if you see clouds that are colder, they're higher, warmer, they're lower. And generally, there's relationships between lower level clouds and upper level clouds in terms of their opacity. Lower level clouds tend to be thicker. Higher level clouds tend to be thinner. And so you can create relationships to inform the cloud opacity estimate in that way. Ultimately, that just reduces to one problem, which is how much of the light is getting filtered. Right? So, Absolutely. Um, I mean, you, really, the thickness of the cloud is a proxy to the information that you really want to know, which is how much of the light is getting filtered. So why doesn't the satellite have some sort of laser device on it which fires to a like a station which and then you detect how much of what, of what percentage of that light is getting through or not and you can get a direct representation of the thickness of the cloud. Well, so your uh, suggestion or ideas were thinking about how we can determine the exact transmissivity of a cloud and, and why can't the satellite do that. So uh, effectively this satellite just looks at a couple different uh, bands in the spectrum of radiation that is coming back toward its sensor. It doesn't do any projecting forward or or sending any other uh, signals out, such as a laser or anything like that. So um, you have to use 
the observed effectively cloud picture that you get from the satellite across those different spectrums to make your best guess because we don't have the ability to do something like measure the transmissivity directly. But it sounds like a cool technology. Oh, maybe some James Bond type stuff there with some laser satellites. Lasers in space. I support that. <laughs> oh, that's right. Maybe I don't support that. Not that way. For science only. Yes. Nice lasers. Thank you very much for the presentation. I just have one, uh, have one quick question about the uh, open scaling method because obviously the, the ultimate uh, aim of this project or part of your work is to uh, estimate how much PV power is being injected to the electricity network, mm -hmm. so in different parts of the network. So I, I'm just wondering how you want to calculate the accuracy of your method because obviously no one is really aware of how much PV is being generated. So this is really hard to no, really, is your method is, is working or not? And also, there's a chance that the PV systems which you are using for upscaling, they are not good representative of all PV systems. So basically, you can be overfitting your result to that certain uh, number of PV systems. So, yeah. yeah so, so Navid's question is really digging into how can we be sure that. Uh, the modeling via the satellite is performing well in terms of generating PV system power outputs and also um, validating that beyond the statistical representation that we get from our own monitoring, right? So in our own monitoring, we can see if there's, uh, if, if we're doing well, but beyond that, we don't know. And um, I don't have a very good answer for you on that. And I will say that that challenge is shared by anybody doing this type of work. And the, the real essence of that challenge is you'll never actually know if you are getting the forecast exactly right and we need to be okay and comfortable with that. But that doesn't actually matter. What matters is, are we providing the spatial and temporal modeling required to enable the solutions to offset the variability in the network level load or the frequency and voltage problems? So I think we can do that without actually getting all the way to the scientific solution of we are this accurate across every part of the simulation. Okay, so we've uh, used all of our time. Thank you so much, Nick, for the Thank you for your uh, invite, excellent, Anna. Very inspiring kind. presentation. And we're really looking forward to continuing the conversation. So please join me, everyone, in thanking Nick. Thank you. Pleasure.